Lula. Okay, now where did she come from in your mind? Lula, Lula's entirely fictional. Lula um, in the first book uh, was a hoe, and uh, she served a certain purpose. Right. <laughs> well, she was a very good hoe. Um, and she had a really good hoe wardrobe, which she has kept, you know. I mean, and Lula is, pro you know, I mean, she's one of my favorite cats. I love writing Lula. Lula, um, because you, you can just go anywhere with her. You, ha you seem very tasteful. Do you have a Lula side with clothing? Um, yeah, but people, you know, try to prevent me from going in public like that. What about Lula's food tastes, which tend to be bingy, right? So why do you think I'm in Spanx? <laughs>
So I'm, I'm putting it right here. Yeah. Now, there goes my first question, which is, so tell me, are you anything like Stephanie Plum? <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, you are a Jersey girl, but South River isn't Trenton, was it? Um, no, but it's Central Jersey. And when I was, as an adult, my parents moved from South River to Mercerville, okay. um, which is right on the outskirts of Trenton. And so we actually spent a lot of time in the Berg um, because they had great restaurants and we, we would go into the Berg for that. So I, so I did know that area. Um, I couldn't set the series in South River. I didn't think there was enough good crime there. <laughs> Trenton has a lot of crime. Trenton, no problem. They have a river for bodies. They have, <laughs> they, they had it all. <laughs> Again, I've often been curious, as the years have gone on, do you do research and reconnaissance trips to Trenton to find out like what's the latest place Lula's gonna eat at or things like that? Yeah, no, you know, I used to. In the beginning, I did a lot of research and I hung out with the Trenton cops, um, hung out with, um, bounty hunters, and, but as the series progressed, um, I found that I really didn't need to go back and do that research because I had really created the world of Plum. And um, some of it still holds. The truth is that the Berg is more like the Berg maybe 70 years ago. The Berg is an ethnic evolving neighborhood. So um, when I first became acquainted with the Berg, um, not that it was 70 years ago, because of course I'm just not that old. <laughs> um, but it really was an Italian enclave. Um, it no longer is. It has, um, it has really changed, and it has changed many, many times. So um, no, I don't, I don't do a lot of research um, in terms of that. I, what I find that I, I, I do research for plot now um, a little bit more, because in the beginning, there was no plot to my books. <laughs> I, I, get, I keep getting taken aback by her. You didn't start writing yeah, for only, quite a while. It's only begun. It's gone. Yeah. I mean, you didn't start writing for quite a while. Uh, what made you finally decide to become a writer? I was always the kid that could draw. And when I went to college, I majored in fine arts. Um, and then uh, I got married, had a couple kids. And I realized that um, it, it wasn't exactly the right spot for me. Communication is very vague with painting. And I realized that I love to communicate with people. I, um, I found that I could be funny. Um, I liked making people laugh. I was breaking out from the pigment, so, <laughs> um, so painting wasn't, um, wasn't great. So I thought, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna write a book. Because you know, I was a stay-at-home mom. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of money. Uh, neither um, uh, my husband's family didn't have money. I didn't come from money. I'm very blue collar. My dad worked in a factory. And so I said, um, we need to make money, so I'm gonna write a book. I'm gonna <laughs> write a book and I'm gonna sell it to the movies and I'm gonna be rich and famous. <laughs> And I finally am. <laughs> <laughs> but not the way you planned it. No, actually it um, took 10 years for me to sell that first book. <clears throat> I'm a really slow learner. <laughs> um, I had a lot of rejections. I started collecting the rejections in a shoe box and then it was in a, um, a shirt box. And then <clears throat> after 10 years it was in a big cardboard packing crate. And, um, and, but you know, I had this very supportive family who encouraged me to keep going. And I realized the more I wrote, the more I loved writing and I didn't want to give it up. And I just stuck with it and um, you know, it worked out for me. Again, in those years when you were getting the rejection notices, do you remember like maybe the nastiest one you got that you now read and chuckle over? Yeah, I, I didn't really get any nasty ones. Um, like, I had one written in crayon on a bar napkin. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, mostly they, they were just, you know, very simple little notes like, you know, you have no talent, don't send this again. <laughs> that sort of thing. 
wish I had that now. I burned them. I burned all those damn rejections. Oh. I know. I know it. I sat on my curb after um, we. I I was I was really losing heart, and we needed the money. And so one day I took that big box and I sat on the curb in front of my house and I burned them all. And I was just sobbing, crying. And then um, the next day I borrowed a suit from my sister and I went out and I did temp work for manpower. And I did that for like four months. I was just horrible. I was just hideous. I mean, um, it's a good thing that I figured out how to write because I can't do anything else. <laughs> Is that why you write and Stephanie bounty hunts? Because she can't do anything else? She can't. She is, yeah. Well, you, it turns out, you know, you don't have to. I, I thought that you probably didn't have to know a whole lot to be a bounty hunter. I, I saw Charles Grodin and Robert De Niro in Midnight Run. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, how cool is this, right? Of course, this was before Dog. Right. Dog, dog wasn't on the scene. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I would have had to dress Stephanie different if I knew about Dog. Right. <laughs> and um, and her, she would have had, um, like, really bad bleached out hair. Yeah, yeah. You know, black leather. So, um, but, but this was way before him. On the way to Stephanie, though, you did, you spent a lot of years writing romance. Yeah. Now, why that first instead of? Because that's what I was reading. Okay. And what I realized after um, all of this time, you know, because I came out of the Douglas College Art Department, and it was pretty far out there. It was um, close to New York, so we had some very famous people, Roy Lichtenstein and George Siegel, and, uh, um, that were my professors. And, um, and the attitude was, you know, you do art for yourself. Right. And if someone else um, comes to it and enjoys it, that's great, but that's basically not why you do it. It's, it's an inner process. And after 10 years, what I realized is that I wasn't having any fun, that, that that wasn't who I was, that I didn't want to write books for myself. I wanted people to read my books. I wanted people, I wanted to make people laugh. I wanted to communicate. I wanted, um, I think of myself more as an entertainer mm -hmm. than a writer. I work very hard at my craft, but what I really like about it is that I can entertain. And, um, and I have no idea what the question was. Well, it was why, why you finally gave up, why you, fi why you went into romance first. Oh, yeah, okay. Because you were reading so, it. So anyway, after 10 years, I said, I have to be more practical about this. And I was a young mother and wife, and I was in love, and I understood that. And, what I, and I was reading romance novels. I loved the romance genre. So, um, so that's what I decided to do. I said, I'm going to stop with all this, you know, fancy, esoteric stuff. And I sat down and wrote a little romance novel. And that was finally what got published. I worked at that temp agency for four months and finally got a letter um, saying that somebody was going to buy my book. And it was Second Chance at Love. I sold it for $2,000 and uh, quit my job the next day. <laughs> But then why, why did you leave the romance genre? And well, I sort of got kicked out. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, were, I, you, were you behaving badly? Yes. Yes, I was. <laughs> I, I like romance. I, I love romance. I don't think I was ever the world's best romance writer. Um, I had a hard time with the uh, sex parts. You know, I mean, at the time when I was writing, you were expected to have maybe two or three scenes that were pretty explicit sex. So I was pretty good in the beginning, but by about book four, I had totally run out of positions. <laughs> <laughs> and <clears throat> I, was, um, I was really stretching for it. <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, and then there was the language thing. Uh, we, this was, you know, 100 years ago. Romance isn't like this anymore, but it was, we had expectations, and there was a, a language to um, romance. They, um, there were certain words that we could use. Um, for instance, um, we did a lot of talking about throbbing manhood. <laughs> <clears throat> and so, but like I'm from Jersey, right? And I kept thinking, it's a dick. <laughs> And I can say that now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So you, you were really writing Ranger before you even thought of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I was sneaking in. I was having a hard time getting the pages out of relationship. I was sneaking in little mysteries. And then my editor would rip them out, you know, and I'd have to rewrite. And so it became pretty clear to me that I was not in exactly okay. the right spot. And I decided I was going to reinvent myself, took a year off, and, um, you know, and, and in the end, uh, came up with Stephanie. Where did she come from? She came from my experience with romance, really. Um, and so did the men in the series. Um, the men, Ranger and Joe Morelli, are really bad boy heroes right out of Regency romances. Um, they are very good, strong characters, but they, have, they pretty much have their own um, set of rules. Um, Ranger more than Morelli. Morelli has restructured himself um, into police work, but um, but they, you know, I, I learned I learned about character with the romance novels, and I learned what I liked in a heroine. I knew I had a whole list of things that I wanted my heroine to be. I wanted her to be resilient. I wanted her to have tenacity. I wanted her to be flawed, but that her flaws would not be hurtful. And um, you know, and. I think that a lot of this is what has made the series popular because I write about positive people, people that we know, you know, I mean, Stephanie eats fried chicken and pizza with her hands. <laughs> she doesn't have great hair. She, um, you know, I, she, she does have really good metabolism, <laughs> which um, there are days when I would really like to see Stephanie busting out of her jeans, but <laughs> so far, no. With, it's interesting. I, I was going to raise this later, but if you broached it up. When you're talking about Morelli and you're talking about Ranger, as, as a fair gentleman, why must both of your heroes be dark? I guess I like them that way. <laughs> All right, now it comes out. I mean, it's like usually it's oh yeah. There's usually always the blonde guy and the dark-haired guy, and you have the dark-haired guy and the darker-haired guy. <laughs> Is that's just you? Well, um, yeah, but you know, but I do have other series going. I have right, um, this uh, big sexy guy named Diesel. Yeah. Uh huh. And. Um, you know, so I'm spreading it around. Okay, okay. Did you I still hope for you? Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'll keep you in mind. Good, good. When did you decide that Stephanie was going to have two guys tugging at her libido from the very beginning? No, um, in the beginning, when I when I started this, um, I was watching Moonlighting, and I love Moonlighting. Okay. And I loved that kind of sexual adventure that was going on between Maddie and Dave. Um, and I, I wanted to have that um, because, you know, I think it was like, what was it, um, the uh, year three in Moonlighting when they finally, you know, got together and did the deed, and then I was like, eh, done. <laughs> you know, because some of the fun had gone out of it, and I thought, I want to do this. I, wanted, I don't want to develop this series into a family saga. I want it to, I want to keep that spirit of adventure, that mystery, that, that business that, um, like, I think that getting to know people is very exciting. And I didn't, I didn't want to lose it. I mean, little did I know I was going to have to keep this going for 22 years. I mean, you know, <laughs> I was pretty naive in the beginning. So, um, so I was fine with book one, and I was fine with book two. And then what I realized is that, you know, you have these two adult people who are very attracted to each other. And it was impractical to think that I could keep them apart forever. So um, that really was why Ranger had been there from the beginning. But he, he had been, you know, he was this guy living in a vacant lot. And, um, and so I decided that I was going to bring Ranger in just to complicate her life. Um, so, um, and then he became, you know, more of a hero. He um, actually grew two inches. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Height. Yeah. yeah. Height. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That that would be a whole other lecture. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
interesting thing with it happens a bit with Ranger and this also with Stephanie is that although it's very entertaining and very light, there are dark shadows in these people's lives. Like Steffi had that awful first marriage, you know, and with the woman who keeps coming back, who, right. you know, seduced uh -huh. her husband on the dining room table and everything. And Joyce. Yeah. And, 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 and Ranger, Ranger, you hint at all kinds of dark political and military stuff yeah. that we never, are we going to really ever get to the bottom of some of that? Well, one of the, the fun things is that Ranger is this very mysterious guy. And I can give the reader little tiny bits of information about him as the series goes on. And I would hope that we never really know everything about Ranger. Ranger clearly has a dark past. He's working on his karma. Um, doesn't allow him to become um, maybe as involved with Stephanie as he would like to be. He has a mission in life. And we're not exactly sure what it is, um, but um, see, now, you know, notice he didn't ask me how long Ranger's ponytail was. <laughs> no. Well, these are... Yeah, we don't want to know that. Okay. No, no, no. no. I'm interested in, in, in his background yeah. and everything. But. Yeah, he, um, and, and we don't, we just don't know everything. We know a little bit more about him now. And Ranger has really grown throughout the series. He um, probably more than any other character because he started out as, as this guy who was um, a bounty hunter and um, just sort of leading a very um, dark, mysterious existence. And he's now a successful businessman. He owns a building. He has um, this supply of brand new shiny black cars. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't, we don't know where they come from. <laughs> <laughs> he also has the best decorated apartment yes, in the yeah. whole series. Oh, know. yeah. He has a very sexy um, apartment in the top of his building. and um, Very high so, thread count on the sheets. And, yes. Yes, that's very important. Yeah. When you're trying to you know, impress Stephanie, yeah. she's all about thread count. <laughs> <laughs> With Stephanie keeps putting her foot in it, whatever, whatever happens to her. But she's still very endearing about it. Do you do that yourself in real life? Do you still put your foot in things? No, I'm perfect. Because <laughs> I, I often wonder if like some of the you know, mishaps she has, not that you're you know, running around bounty hunting and exploding cars, but do you ever say, oh yeah, I just did this parking the car wrong. I'm going to use that for Stephanie? Um, no. Well, you know, last time I was here in Toronto, I did fall off the stage and break my foot. So. Yeah, I did. It was, it, was at, um, it was at a bookstore, and they had me up on this stage, and it was all dark, and, um, and they, had, um, they had a DJ. I noticed you don't have a DJ. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> Honestly. Anyway, they had this very sexy DJ in the back, and, um, and we said, you know, I, we don't think it's a good idea to put Janet on a stage. And they were like, no, 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 you know, we do this with all our authors. So the fourth, fourth person to come up was a lady in a wheelchair. So oh. I had to go down to the lady. Um, I twisted my foot on this little one inch riser, <laughs> fell down the stairs and broke my foot. So I'm laying there and <laughs> And I'm trying, you know, not to be too embarrassing. And the DJ, he doesn't know what the hell to do. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't know if he should stop the music, if he should make it louder, you know. And so, of course, you know, what do you say? In classic, I'm okay, right? So they scooped me up, and they took my desk, and they put it down on the floor so I didn't have to back up on the stage. And I finished the signing. And it went on for, I don't know, like three hours. Oh, my God. Yeah. And you know we always take pictures. If anybody you know has their cell phone, you get a picture tonight if you want one. So, you know, fix your hair and everything. And, <laughs> um, and the guy that I was traveling with, my tour manager, was the guy taking pictures. And I'm at this desk, and he's standing in front of me, and he's taking the pictures. And every now and then he'd go. And I knew that my foot was swelling, you know, more and more. And so after the signing, they picked me up, and they took me to the Four Seasons. I was staying at the Four Seasons. And they um, put me in a wheelchair and took me to the bar and got me all liquored up. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next day, they flew me out to Chicago um, to the hospital, and I had a big cast put on my foot. And so I finished book tour with this big cast on my foot. Now. Um, this didn't happen to Stephanie yet. No, 
but it might. It might, yes. It might. With, okay, Stephanie's family, we're getting into those people. I, I often wondered when you were working on the book, did you have any, any, you said moonlighting inspired the romantic tensions. Did something inspire the sense of comedy? Was it some, did Seinfeld have anything to do with it or shows like that? Um, no, it's just, you know, it's just the way I think. I'm, I'm the person who's always laughing at in, inappropriate moments. <laughs> you know, when everything is supposed to be very serious, you know, I'm like dying inside, you know, I'm just snickering. And I think, uh, because a lot of humor is point of view. It's, um, you know, the whole world is over there and I'm standing here. And, um, and you, just, you just see things a little differently. And that's part of comedy. I think I also, I grew up um, loving comedy. Um, you know, I love Lucy. Of course, naturally, I watched it in reruns. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I think, you know, um, those are my roots. I, I grew up in Jersey. There's a lot of attitude there. Um, uh, it was... And you know, this was back when we were allowed to be funny, right? Remember that? Remember when we were allowed to be funny? And now, you know, we all have to be politically correct. So, you know what I think about political correctness? <laughs> I guess because, you, you, well, your characters, because I would imagine with the neighborhood they're in and the life they're living, they have enough time to be politically correct. It would be stupid, wouldn't it? Well, it, it, yeah, but I mean, it's not even a matter of time. I think that we're trying to, um, how about if we all tried really hard just to be kind and to practice some common sense instead of legislating it, you know? And that was the way I grew up. I mean, we did not legislate kindness. We all knew that's what we were supposed to do. It was what you learned as a kid and hopefully, you know, you took with you. And so I just, you know, that's, that's what I bring to my story. St Stephanie's mom. Uh, she seems constantly to be going when things get bad to the liquor cabinet. Is it just, how serious a drinker is she? Or is she, does she just like to top it up? Well, see, um, there was a book early on in the series where um, she had some ambitions. And um, I think there was one book where she wanted to be a nurse. She wanted to go back to school. And then by the next book, I was thinking, now nah, just make her an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, she, she doesn't seem to be getting worse over the books. Or, is, or am I missing that? Or am I just used yeah, to it? Yeah, no, I think, you know, I think she has a rhythm to her. She, She's yeah. found her niche. She's, um, you know. And you wait to see how bad an event is. If it's going to send yeah. her... Sometimes, I love the way you indicate that she looks toward the cabinet. <laughs> well, you know, there are, there are rules. I mean, you don't, um, you really don't want to take a snort at one in the afternoon if somebody's watching. And, um, and then, you know, she irons, too. Right. Um, she, she irons when she's really annoyed. She just, she'll iron for hours. And um, personally, I would rather go to the liquor cabinet. Yeah. <laughs> How good a cook is she? I think she's a very good cook. Because I wonder if it's just, you know, Stephanie taking the free food and liking it. But Morelli yeah, seems that, to like yeah. it, too. No, I, no, I think her mom is a, is a very good cook. Okay. Um, and I think that's part of her heritage. That's part of the world that I've created in the Berg, is that, you know, these are, um, these are good working class people. They um, wash their car every Saturday. They buy... Um, well, it used to be they bought American, but that's gone, isn't it? Now they buy Chinese. But, um, but they're, um, you know, the women uh, keep their houses clean. They, um, they take pride in cooking and being able to make a good pie. And, um, you know, that's, that's that world. Now we get to the anarchy. Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> You thought I wouldn't get there. Of course I was going to go there. Where, okay, when, at one point, when you were doing the universe, did you decide you needed an extra wild card in there? Yeah, or? no, I'm related to Grandma. <laughs> yeah, Grandma is a combination of my uh, Grandma Fanny and my Aunt Lena. 
Okay. And when I was a little girl um, in South River, I, we lived in this big house that my, my grandpa built. And um, it was a big extended family. My parents and my Aunt Lena and my Uncle Mickey. And, um, and so, um, what was the question? Well, where did she come from? Where did she come from? from? Right, okay, so, so I lived in this house and it was when I was, when I was little. Um, I lived in this house with all these people and every morning all of the ladies in the neighborhood would come over and we had a big um, table and it was a big eating, eating kitchen and they would sit there and they would go through the obits and decide who they were, you know, because we didn't have a lot of entertainment in South River then. <laughs> like, you know, we didn't have a country club or anything. We had two really great funeral parlors. And that was what you did. Uh, you, went, you went to um, viewings. And so Aunt Lena and the ladies, I mean, they'd be at a viewing five nights out of seven. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, sometimes, you know, they had to go to people they didn't know, but it didn't, it didn't really matter. I mean, they had cookies and that was where you got all the gossip. And then you could come back the next day and you'd rehash it, you know, what kind of tie Harry Farver had on. And um, you know, makeup. They were they were always checking out the makeup um, and commenting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I grew up in Astoria, Queens, and in, in the in Italian Catholic neighborhood. And they used to always drag me. It kind of warped me for life. I would get dragged to go to all the viewings, uh -huh. and you know, and they would all comment on that wasn't his best suit. Why is he wearing that suit? Right. You know, <laughs> why did they have him wear lipstick? He never wore lipstick. You know. Yeah. And they ought to have done it. Now, I, I, that was back in the 50s and 60s. Do they still do it today, or do we just keep doing it in the, in the plum world? You know, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure, because I kind of moved out of that area. Um, I left South River, and in fact, left Jersey, you know, a while ago, because we started following my husband's career. And, um, you know, I didn't stay in that community. But I suspect there are still, you know, communities that, that do that. Although, you know, we have the internet now, so you don't have to go to viewing so much. Right. Do you ever get people write to you and say, I'm in the Berg and it's not like that anymore? Um, no, or it is like that. It's more like I write to them and say, don't go to the Berg. <laughs> <laughs> Lula. OK, now where did she come from in your mind? Another, everybody's. Lula, Lula's entirely fictional. Lula, um, in the first book, uh, was a hoe. And uh, she served a certain purpose. Right. <laughs> and then. Um, <laughs> well, she was a very good hoe. Um, and she had a really good hoe wardrobe, <laughs> which she has kept, you know. Um, but when I went to write the second book, I, I couldn't get Lula out of my head. There was something about that character that um, I found interesting. And so I brought her back. Um, and I gave her a job in the Bonds office. And every, every book, she became a little bit more important mm -hmm. um, until now. And what I realized by book four and five is that it was a very good way of bringing humor in because Lula could do and say anything. Um, she could do and say things that I couldn't have my heroine do, that Stephanie couldn't do. So, I mean, and Lula is probably, you know, I mean, she's one of my favorite, I love writing Lula. Lula, um, because you, you can just go anywhere with her. Yeah, I'm, every, I mean, I watch in every book for what's she wearing. And uh -huh. now, do those come, do you ever spot them in tr thrift shops or on the street, or do they come all from the depths of your truly sick imagination? Yes. So, <laughs> yeah, my imagination and, and, you know, my own closet, yeah. I okay. <laughs> Now you seem. I have my Lula moments. You ha you seem very tasteful. Do you have a Lula side with clothing? Um, yeah, but people, you know, try to prevent me from going in public like that. <laughs> okay, okay. What about Lula's food tastes, which tend to be bingey, right? You know, yeah. she's got to have this chicken. She's got to have that. So why do you think I'm in Spanx? <laughs> <laughs> do you share the same love of of really greasy fried chicken that she oh, does? Oh yeah. So where do you go? I'll eat anything fried and, and with icing on it. OK. <laughs> Preferably together. Yeah, yeah, any, yeah I'm there. What's, what's your chicken of choice? Um, uh, I, like, uh, uh, I like Popeyes, extra spicy. OK. Uh -huh. 
And, and what about things with frosting? Are you a Krispy Kreme girl? or? A... Um, no, I, I like birthday cake. Ah, okay. So you could see me like, you know, prowling the supermarket um, for birthday cakes that people have forgot to pick up. <laughs> you know, and I just scrape off happy birthday, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, how much birthday cake can you eat on your own? I, I can do a pretty good job. Really? Yeah. Okay. I can. Do, you, do you eat while you're writing or instead of writing or as a reward? Or? Yeah, no, actually, um, I do. I eat uh, when I write. And not birthday cake, but uh, I have a pretty insane writing schedule, mostly because there were all those years, you know, when I was really scratching and clawing my way up the ladder. And, uh, and then finally I became a success, and it's like you have the keys to the candy store, and you have a hard time saying no. They say, hey, why don't you do this? And I'm like, okay. And before you know it, you can't possibly do all those books that you have a contract for. Um, the other word for that is greed. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, but um, so I have um, a pretty long day. And actually, you know, I'm, I'm making fun of it, but I really do like it. I like staying in the story. I like my life. I love my routine. I love getting up in the morning and going into that other world. So I'm up at 5. Um, I get coffee, and I have a little dog. And we go to my office, and I'm at my computer by about 5.30. And um, I write through the morning, um, break to have something to eat, and then I work in the afternoon again. And um, I, I have a tendency, when I'm under deadline and I have those really long hours, I keep myself in the seat, you know, by snacking. Okay. And so, um, and you know, can they we kind of what, what, open the door and throw cheese doodles in at me, uh, you know. And then, I was going to say, are the snacks <laughs> sweet, salty, all of the above? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever I can get my hands on. Good. I, I talked once uh, to Laura Lipman, who has you know, a major detective and then writes other books and standalones, and she said that she always felt she wanted to write the other books, but then sometimes when she was in the middle of them, she felt like Tess Monahan, her detective, was calling her back saying, why are you cheating on me? Do you ever get that with Stephanie? No, actually I'm just the opposite. What I find is that it's really nice to move out of that world into another world and into some other heroine's head. Um, because I did you know, just Stephanie for a long time. And, you know, you have to worry about it going stale, and, um, and you have all these other ideas floating around. So I started doing other little mini-series, and I found that I really liked it. When I'm doing Fox and O'Hare, um, Kate O'Hare, you like that? I think it's, I think it's a great series. I work with uh, Lee Goldberg as my co-author. Um, we make a great team. He, he can do stuff that I can't do. Um, and, but I, can, I go into Kate O'Hare's head. She's so different from Stephanie. Stephanie kind of puts one foot in front of the other and floats through her day. And by the grace of God, you know, she succeeds in getting her man. But she doesn't really have any aspirations. She's a very, um, you know, average, hasn't found herself yet never really knew who she was. I mean, okay, so she wanted to be Wonder Woman and Peter Pan when she was little, but aside from that, um, Kate O'Hare always knew what she wanted. She, um, she came out of a military family. She believes in right and wrong. She loves her job. She's good at it. She's tough. She's um, dedicated. She has a passion for it. So um, what I find is that when I leave Stephanie and I go into Kate O'Hare, um, it's just very invigorating. It's, it's refreshing. It's stimulating. It makes me think. I have to stretch a little bit to be in her head. And then when I leave Kate and I come back to Stephanie, what I find is that I kind of know a little bit more about Stephanie. I think to myself, you know, I'm comparing her to Kate, and I'm thinking, Huh, you know, I, I never knew that about her, but she has to be thinking some of these thoughts too. She has to be wondering, why, why am I like this? Why don't I have a passion for something? Who am I? What do I, you know, what do I want to be? Yeah, do I, is this it? Is this, is this everything that is in store for me, being a bounty hunter? 
And so, um, so I actually really like it. I like that process. Cool. You have this rich family of characters who you now know so well and we know so well, you can just write them, right? And they happen. But what about this? Every time there's a story they have to get involved in, do you pre structure that or do you just dive into it or what happens? Um, no, I always I have to know something before I begin. I have to um, I have to have some structure. I know who the villain is. I know what the really terrible things are going to be that are happening. Um, for instance, in this book, it's fleas. <laughs> yeah, killer fleas, toxic killer. Fle I'm not telling you any more than that. Okay. Um, so, uh, so you know, I know the beginning. I know the end. I know a few things in the middle. I know what the bad guy is, I know what the crime is. Um, and I use it kind of like you know, railroad tracks that, that my Stephanie train is gonna run on. Um, a lot of, I, don't, I don't do a very detailed outline. I do that as I go. Um, I start writing, and when I go to bed at night, I take a steno pad with me, and I write down some notes about what I think I'm gonna do the next day. I, I, have, I write a couple sentences of what I did that day, and then I write some sentences about where I'm going the following day. So that somehow when mm -hmm. I sleep, it all comes together in my head. And I wake up and I have these ideas and I'm very excited to go in there. And then after about an hour and a half, <laughs> I'm looking for the cheese doodles. <laughs> <laughs> have, have you ever stopped yourself or changed a story that was getting just too dark that you thought maybe the Stephanie um, world couldn't handle? Well, yeah, I'm always readjusting. Um, uh, you're readjusting, you know, with everything as you're moving along, you're making all these decisions. Um, is it too dark? Um, is it is there enough at stake? Um, periodically, when you write with a lot of humor, periodically you have to raise the stakes for the reader, or else they become lulled into this, you know, blissful, you know, um, boring kind of state of happiness. So, um, so I'm always aware, you know, that like somebody has to die now. It's page 100, yep. you know, it's that, it's that kind of thing. It's true because sometimes I'm going along and I'm having such a good time with them that I think, oh, now there's the plot. We have to go back to the plot because that's what's carrying us along. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so, um, so, you're, so I make decisions like that all the time as I go. And then, of course, when I finish the book, um, my, my family... Uh, you know, we are, we are, I have a team, I have a whole team. My son, my daughter, my husband, um, we're all in this together. We all, we're like a little herd. We live together in the same neighborhood. They, uh, they, they come over, we, we even like each other, you know, <laughs> besides working together. <clears throat> and they're always my first editors. And um, they also pull me back in. You know, they'll say, um, you know, this is confusing. Um, the transitions, um, you know, aren't smooth. Um, you, uh, the crime is not serious enough. It's not, the book isn't funny enough. I mean, it's endless. Um, and then I listen to all of this and I go back and I restructure and I do some rewriting. And then it goes into my Random House editor. Okay. Have you ever, have you already decided if and when the series ends, how it's gonna end? Um, well, I know if I did end the series, I would have to write two endings because because <laughs> one would be with Ranger and one would be with Joe Morelli. You don't think there's a chance for a menage a trois? Or... That's, uh, there are some of us who are waiting for that, let's said, be honest. And okay. you said you weren't dark. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but no, seriously, have you planned out what you think is going to happen? No. No. No, I'm just, you know, going along, and I don't plan to end it anytime soon, you know, because, okay. you know, it's fun. I think it's fun. I'm having fun writing it, and, um, you know, the readers still seem to be having fun reading it, and we're increasing our audience, so, uh, so it's all good. Without asking you to tell tales out of school specifically, but when you look back at, let's say, the 22 Stephanies, are there a couple you don't like? Um, I, there's, you know what, the second book was very difficult to write, which is, I think, classic. Um, I've talked to other writers who have said, because the first book was such a success. I mean, it wasn't a success in selling books because I didn't actually sell that many books. 
um, but it was a, a critical success. People got people talking. Um, critics really liked it because it was something a little different. Because what I did when I started the Plum Series <clears throat> was, you know, I was I was watching Tom Clancy, and uh, he was all of a sudden he just was, you know, this huge massive success, and he invented the techno thriller, and I thought, you know, that's what I want to do. Not that I think I can do it on that scale, but what I realized is that he found a hole in the marketplace. And I thought, if you really want to be a success in any business, that's really what you need to do. You need to find the hole in the marketplace. What is it that people want and need and don't have right now? And what can you, what can you bring to that? And what I realized is that I could take what I loved as a romance writer, which was the very positive people, the humor, the sexiness, the romantic chase, and I could squash it into a mystery format. And there were a lot of um, female detectives out there by then, Sue Grafton and Sarah Paretsky, but they were kind of hard-boiled um, women. You know, they were, um, they were, you know, wearing women's clothes, well, barely. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I thought, no, you know, what I want is I want a soft-boiled uh, heroine, and I, I didn't, I mean, I didn't want my, I mean, I can't imagine cutting your hair with nail scissors, okay, maybe my bangs, but you know, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And so I wanted to create a heroine that was more like me and more like the, um, the women that I knew. And so that was how the Plum Series really came together was that I, um, I made a hybrid. I really combined two genres. Back at the beginning when you were talking, you said your dream was always going to be, you said, to you know, write a book and sell it to the movies and make a lot of money. Well, you wrote a lot of books and you made a lot of money, and then you finally, one of them got made into a movie. How did you feel about that? Well, I, you know, I sold that book to the movies um, b even before One for the Money hit the bookstores. Yeah, I, I, yeah well, you know, Holly Weird. <laughs> Go figure. Um, I had... Uh, I sold one, one for the money to Scribner for a small amount of money, and it was a very reduced print run, um, and they were putting it out into a small package. And my agent um, at the time took it to the West Coast, and there was a big bidding war for it. And um, Columbia TriStar won the book um, and uh, got it for a million dollars. Oh. Yeah, so... Um, I'm in Northern Virginia in my little um, track house, uh, and my kids are in college um, and with like astronomical, you know, education loans. And um, my agent calls, and it's nine o'clock at night because you know it's six o'clock West Coast time. And he tells me that I just made a million dollars, and I'm looking out on my front lawn. And glittering in the moonlight are all my shingles <laughs> <laughs> that had blown off my roof. <laughs> and I had no hope in hell of getting a new roof. So, I mean, this is, this is where I'm at when I learn, you know, that I'm a millionaire. And because, I mean, we did not come from money. We, we were like, um, you know, at 8 o'clock at night, you'd get a phone call and they'd say, you know, Uncle Mickey broke his dentures. Do you have any money? And we'd be going through the couch, you know, looking for change, and the whole family would be contributing, trying to get Uncle Mickey and another, you know, uppers. So, <laughs> so I mean, it was it was unreal. And I mean, I started smiling. I did not stop smiling for three days. It was like they were going to have to surgically remove that smile from my face. And we went out shopping. I went out shopping um, with my son. Uh, my husband didn't go because he got a migraine. He was so overwhelmed. I'm serious. I'm serious. I went out to the mall with my son, and we walked around all day and because I wanted to spend my money. Of course, I didn't have the money then, but I knew. And, um, and you know, when you don't have money for so long and you clip coupons and you're so frugal with everything, you just can't all of a sudden spend it. So it's like we've been there for hours, and... Um, and I ended up getting two things. Um, one was, um, okay, so ladies, if you have no money and you've been like struggling all these years, 
what do you get? You get new towels, right? <laughs> You know, because my towels like had all been washed out and were threadbare and had those strings, you know, yeah. hanging down on them. So I got new towels, and then when we were leaving the mall, we went past this home goods store, and I bought a bread machine. <gasps> and so um, I think I used it three times, <laughs> which meant like you know I had um, three loaves of bread that cost me twenty-seven dollars a piece. <laughs> That's when you knew you were rich. Yeah, that's when I knew I was rich. I think it's time to turn it over to people who I'm sure have some good questions out there. Um, have, you ever re have you ever received ideas from your readers that helped you write any of your books? Um, no, actually, I'm very careful about that. I don't, um, I don't read fan fiction. Uh, um, readers send me ideas, and um, you know, I might glance at them, but um, I think that's, you know, that's a dangerous thing to do. Because, um, like, I worked real hard for my money. I don't want to lose it in litigation. <laughs> so, um, no, I, I try not to do that. Will you soon be coming out with a new Nick Fox and Katie O'Hara book? Yes, in June. The oh, Pursuit. Good. What's it called? It's called The Pursuit. Terrific. Yeah, and that'll be out in June. Thank you. What does Stephanie think of Donald Trump? She'd want to take him to her hairdresser. <laughs> we burst out laughing while reading. Do you burst out laughing while writing? Um, no, not very often, but sometimes I think I'm pretty damn clever. <laughs> <laughs> you are. <laughs> Hi. Um, you were a ghost writer in your first books and then became your own name. Was that because they found out who you were, you went to your name, or you just decided to? Um, when I first started writing, um, when I was writing for the Second Chance at Love Line, the, um, um, at the time, romance writers did not use their own names. Your publisher um, pretty much owned your name. And so um, that was just the way it was done. So I was Steffi Hall for those three first books with Second Chance at Love. Then when I moved over to Bantam, um, Carolyn Nichols um, was the woman in charge of that line and um, she was very progressive and she thought that it was a good idea to let her writers use their own names. So I became um, Janet Ivanovich after that. Um, little did I know that I was gonna have to sign Ivanovich. <laughs> I would not, either I would marry someone named Adams or I would change my name because. So you would have originally, you, if you could, use your own name when you start out? Um, yeah, I, okay. you know what? I was just so happy to get published, I would have called myself anything. <laughs> no, it's just, it's interesting. You called yourself Stephanie. Yes. And then you created Stephanie. What does Stephanie mean to you? Um, I think that it's a pretty name. I like the, I like the music of it. And I grew up in this, um, you know, this very ethnic town with a lot of Eastern European immigrants, and there were a lot of Stephanies. And for some reason, it just, uh, it just stuck. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Good evening. Which book took the least amount of time for you to write, and which one took the most amount of time to write? Well, you know, I, I can't answer that. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I know that I write books. Oh yeah, wait a minute, I know. <laughs> um, Wicked. Wicked Charms. Um, we decided to go back and do um, a Wicked, another Wicked book. I love the Wicked series. And, um, and I wanted to do more. And I, um, I decided that I was going to co-author a book with a friend of mine, Fief Sutton, um, who I love and he's very talented. He's a television guy. He has a couple Emmys. He did Cheers for seven years. And um, so we started writing Wicked. And um, I hadn't been in that world for a while. He had never been in that world. 
And that book just went on and on and on and on. And in the end, I think it's a fantastic book. But um, maybe we were just having too much fun together. I don't know. It was like, um, but, it, but that, that book um, took a long time to write. I'm, I'm not sure exactly why. I, well, well, I am, but it would involve alcohol and whatever. <laughs> so yeah, I was wondering if uh, you're going to have any more movie, either for Stephanie Plum series or uh, from your other books. Um, um, are, make, are there, any, are there any more movies in the yeah. works? Um, no, you know, I would, I would love to see more movies, and I would love to see um, some television projects. And they're, you know, they're floating around out there, um, but we have not been able to bring it all together um, for who knows why, because there are a lot of people out there waiting for it. But um, Sony owns the Plum series. Um, they have tried several different scripts just um, for television. Um, can't seem to, um, you know, get it, uh, you know, on its feet. And um, we also have the Fox and O'Hare series out on the West Coast. Um, there are some people working on that one. So hopefully, you know, someday. Uh, one last thing. Uh, are you happy with the cast of the One for the Money? <laughs> Was I happy with the cast of One for the Money? Yes. Yeah, you know, I, I liked, I actually liked the movie. I enjoyed it. Um, I might not have done it exactly that way. I didn't have anything to do with the movie. I didn't. Uh, participate in it when it was done. Um, they were really nice and they came um, down and they had a special screening for me and everything. I thought Heigl actually did a good job. I thought once she got that wig on her head, um, she looked like Stephanie and I think she's a very fine actress. Um, the, the two guys, um, while uh, I liked them at the uh, cast party, <laughs> <laughs> Um, I wasn't sure that they were so much, you know, how I saw Joe Morelli and Ranger. Hi, um, my question is, what's your favorite Lula moment that you have written? Um, what your favorite Lula moment in the books? Lula. Um, my favorite Lula. Um, I did like when the pack of dogs attacked her because she had bacon. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, have, I have given Lula all of my diets, um, which have been many. And, um, you know, so when she was on Atkins and she was um, walking around with five pounds of bacon in her purse. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. I thought that was a good moment. Thank you. Thank you. You, you really do Ranger well. Um, he comes across so hot, I'm telling you, it just drives me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm wondering, is he based on some guy you know? <laughs> well, my husband likes to think. <laughs> but he's not here, so. Are you going to give us, um, a, finally, a marriage? Is she going to make a choice between Joe and, and Ranger? And I'm for Ranger, believe me. Well, she might... She might make the choice, but then she would probably make another choice. Oh. I don't see why we have to choose. <laughs> right? Well, they're both pretty macho. I don't think they'd go for her going with. Yeah, no, this both is of fiction. Them. We can do whatever yeah, we want. Yeah. <laughs> the menage. Back yeah, to that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And last question. Thank you for coming here. You mentioned the idea of television or film and you wished something would happen. Can you give us an idea of any present actresses for either television or film that you think could be a Stephanie? Um, no, you know, I, I don't have anyone in mind. I mean, for years, everyone wanted Sandra Bullock. And she would have been great. She would have been perfect. Okay. But, you know, she's off doing her own things and she's probably past that, um, that Stephanie part. And so right now, I really, I don't, there isn't anyone that pops out at me that I could say, yeah, you know, I would. I think it's probably going to have to be um, someone new, you know, a fresh face, some talented young woman who can really kick ass.
Let me say, Janet, thank you for a lovely time, and thank you for some wonderful books. It's been a pleasure.